Our first speaker today is Rebecca Bowler, who will talk about the diversity of dust geometries and UV bright galaxies at Redshift 7. So, Rebecca, how about you? Go ahead, share your screen. Yep, yeah, perfect. Hi, you can hear Take me. Take it away. Perfect. Um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak at this lovely conference this week. Um, so, as Caitlin said, the, the title of my talk is The Diversity of Dust Geometries in UV Bright Redshift 7 Galaxies. And um, this is a work in preparation um, with these co-authors listed on the slide here. So as I have the, the privilege of being the first speaker, I thought I would motivate my talk by giving a kind of overview of some of the many open questions we have about dust in the epoch of reionization. And this is all um, kind of built on the back of this kind of new regime of detecting very high redshift galaxies using the power of ALMA, which has led to an increasing number of uh, dust continuum detections at redshifts greater than six. So we want to understand what is the dust production mechanism. This is really fundamental. Uh, and part of this is understanding what is the dust temperature, which is currently still quite unknown at these redshifts. Um, and this is all crucial for understanding how much of the star formation at these redshifts is obscured. And this is a nice plot from um, uh, Caitlin Casey's work, which shows you some of the huge uncertainties we have in this high redshift universe um, when considering the cosmic star formation rate density. And this is due to our unknown um, uh, dust properties. So another fundamental question is, what is the geometry of the dust relative to the stars? Um, this is important in particular for energy balance, where you often assume these things are mixed, but is this really true at these, at these high redshifts? And the problem with understanding this um, question at very high redshifts is that the majority of galaxies we know of at redshift seven or so are extremely compact in Hubble data. And even with James Webb, they're going to be barely resolved. So the solution I propose to this problem is to look at the very brightest sources we know at redshifts around seven. And as you can see on the right here, the size luminosity relation, the very brightest sources are, are, are highly extended um, in this is Hubble data measurements. And this allows us to really look in more detail at the, at the morphology of the dust relative to the, to the UV emission. So if we look more closely at these six galaxies in the blue box, these are the six objects that I'm gonna be talking about today. And they're, they're the brightest range of seven galaxies um, in this plot. And you can see that with this single band Hubble data we have that they break up into multiple components, several of them, and, and they're all resolved with Hubble nicely. Um, a couple of these are spectroscopically confirmed in the literature and the other four are um, targeted by rebels. So this is a little uh, prequel to Sanders' talk coming up later today. So these are the six galaxies that I'm proposing for, for follow-up with ALMA. So we did look at these uh, a few years ago with, with quite short integration times, just 10 minutes per source in band six to identify any dust continuum emission. We detected one source, which is shown on the bottom left here um, in this data. So we wanted to, to dig a little bit deeper. So um, in cycle six, we got much deeper observations, uh, 120 minutes per source of the five undetected objects. And you can see the results of this uh, in, the, in the panels on the bottom. So the, the background is the Hubble uh, data, which is the rest frame UV, and the contours is the um, dust continuum emission from ALMA. So it's great that we got these detections, but the real power of this new data was that it has higher resolution than previous observations. So um, previous observations have had resolutions of, of around 1.2 arc seconds or so, um, but this data, we ask for slightly high resolution of around 0.7 arc seconds. And this allows us to pinpoint the, the centroid a little bit better um, and compare it um, nicely to the ultraviolet emission. So this is just an example. If we zoom in on this, this source with the two components, the dust is now, we can see that it appears to be offset from the centroid of the UV emission. So we found um, several different kind of morphologies of the dust. We found some quite compact emission. Um, and this does appear in several cases to be offset from the UV centroid. Now, of course, when you make these comparisons, you have to be very careful with the astrometry. Um, so uh, I've done a lot of checks. All of the, the UV, the imaging probing the UV emission is matched to Gaia to very high accuracy. And the ALMA data, the real limitation here is the fact that these detections are only around signal to noise five. So we expect the error to be about 0.1 arc seconds on the, on the position. Um, but we do think that these are, these are physical offsets that we're seeing here. 
In addition, we see evidence for elongated um, dust emission that's co-spatial with the ultraviolet. For example, in this case, the, the UV, sorry, the ALMA uh, measurement splits into two clumps, which seem to be aligned with the rest frame ultraviolet emission. Okay, so now I'm going to focus in on this one particular source. Um, so this object is at redshift 7.06, spectroscopically confirmed by Sander. Um, and it's one of the brightest redshift 7 galaxies we know of to date, uh, minus 23 UV magnitude. And it's clearly highly extended in the UV. Um, so we only have single band Hubble data for this object. Um, but I, when I was compiling the imaging for this object, I noticed that the in the ultra vista, multi-band near-infrared data that there appears to be an offset between the different wavelengths. So of course I checked the astrometry and, and the, there's no relative astrometric problems between these two data. This appears to be a physical offset. So the, the blue contours here show you where the Y band sits, which is probing the um, far UV part of the spectrum. And the red contour, contour show you where the ground-based K band sits, um, whereas this is a kind of much uh, redder UV probe. So you can see that there's, there appears to be um, different centroids for these different wavelengths. So I went further and made a, a, a color map and now you can clearly see that there's a color gradient across this source um, as observed in the PSF homogenized ground-based data. I, I went further again and, and measured the UV slope from this um, multiband data and you can again see a gradient as you might expect um, in the ultraviolet slope. So how does this color gradient we see in this source correspond to the dust continuum emission that we detect? And I've already shown you this, but here it is again. And, and in this sort of scaling, the background here is the ALMA data. That white blob is the, the dust continuum uh, centroid. So you can see that we observe this clear gradient in the rest room UV colors, and it appears to be pointing in the direction um, of the uh, dust continuum detection, um, as, as you might expect. So this was uh, really exciting and we went one step further um, to extract photometry for each clump. So this, for this I used a deconfusion analysis using the, the TFOT software where the high resolution image is our single band Hubble data and I then used this to deconfuse the low resolution YJHK data from UltraVista. And in this analysis you can clearly see again the two different colors of the two different components uh, pointing towards this dust detection in the upper left of this image. So um, I don't have time to present the rest of the, of the sample, but just to give you a very quick preview, and of course you can pause this if you're watching the recording, um, we do observe gradients in the other three sources where we have a strong ALMA detection. Um, and this is uh, really indicating that this is quite a common effect in these high redshift bright sources. So what are the implications of this color gradient that we observe and the dust offsets we see relative to the kind of centroid of the UV emission? Well, this is telling us that the, the brightest and bluest position in the ultraviolet is not representative of the full galaxy. Um, for example, the size of the source is not just this lower clump, it's the whole object. Um, it's likely not showing us the, the center of mass of the source. And if we were to infer a dust um, uh, attenuation AV value, it wouldn't be representative of the full galaxy. So this has been seen many times before in the literature at lower redshifts um, and also to high redshifts as well in the submillimeter um, uh, community, where essentially uh, the different wavelengths probe different parts of the galaxy, of course. So in this nice example from redshift two uh, from Target et al, the, this is a, a dusty galaxy where the dust centroid is in the center of this stamp. But the, in the UV emission, exactly as we observe in these high redshift galaxies, the source is only two tiny blobs you see either side. As you go to longer wavelengths, you start to see that in fact, the, the, the center of mass of this source is actually where the dust continuum peak is. So in this right-hand plot, you can see the full galaxy is actually uh, much more extended um, relative to the UV. And this is also nicely shown in this plot from Rachel Cochrane's paper on the right, which is from simulations, which shows you that um, the far infrared and the UV morphologies are completely different. And in fact, the, the whole galaxy is much more extended than you see in the UV. Um, and the far infrared peak is, is again offset from the ultraviolet emission. So I'm almost out of time. Um, uh, but just to, to wrap up then, 
What we really need is redder imaging for these high redshift sources. And of course, you know what I'm going to say next. This is exactly what we're going to get with James Webb. And I, I see this as a very exciting preview of the results we're going to, to get from James Webb, where we're going to be able to really um, measure the, the, this kind of longer wavelength part of the spectrum at high resolution for the first time. Um, and as my very final point, I'm going to just kind of pose the question, are we seeing just the tip of the iceberg with ALMA and Hubble? And in fact, when we look deeper with James Webber, we're going to see a much larger extended um, component to this source where we're only seeing the you know, very unobscured parts pop out in the UV. And again, the very brightest part in the far infrared. Um, and with that, I will end and take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I will give folks 20 seconds or so to type up questions on Slack. So Pascal, do you want to? Yeah, I can do. Yeah, there's one question already. Yeah. Um, the question is from Maruja, and the, she's saying, "Great talk. Do you have an indication of how much more extended the dust continuum is compared to the UV? It was hard to read the labels." Um, do you have a particular slide in mind? I mean, oh, for the um, extended UV, extended dust emission, you mean, early on? I mean, it seems to be similar in spatial extent to the ultraviolet emission. It's not It's not much larger. And in fact, there's been other studies that show that usually the dust is more compact than the UV um, emission. And I think you can kind of see from this nice simulation on the right why this might be, because our far infrared observations are, are not going to be deep enough to see the full extent of the galaxy, these kind of fainter, wispy parts of star formation. They're only going to pick up the very central starburst. So we have another question um, Any uh, from Justin. Any thoughts on how the differential distribution of dust might influence uh, some of the SEV fitting assumptions that we all usually make, um, particularly in using uh, energy balance codes like UV plus IR? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Great question. Big I, question. I, have to think about, I think I've had to think about this more and maybe reply fully on Slack because um, uh, it's obviously a big question. But I mean, Essentially, you could break the source into three separate components with very different dust um, properties. And also there's some measurements of the fact that the dust temperature changes with, with star formation rate or infrared luminosity. So you, also you may have to take that into account that, that these two, three things have, could have very, very different properties. And also, you know, in my kind of exaggerated disk of stellar mass here, um, uh, the metallicity could definitely be different across the surface as well and how that impacts the dust composition. I mean, we really just don't know that. So... But yeah, I can reply more on Slack. So, so there are a couple of other great questions too. Um, do these bright LBGs at Redshift Seven have Spitzer detections? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, so they so they do. Um, unfortunately, the one I'm showing you the most of on the left here. Um, it's quite confused with the low redshift galaxy just below. So it's it's really hard to tell if the, the Spitzer centroid, you might expect it to be kind of offset um, to the UV part. So it, it's not, you can't really tell from the current data. Um, and for the other sources, unfortunately, the UV components are too close together to, to for the deconfusion to work. Um, we just need JWST to do this, basically. And um, so, now might be a good time to transition. There are more questions in the Slack, Rebecca, if you can answer them. 